Okay, welcome to episode 20 of the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, we hit 20. That's our episode number we were looking at to get going. We did it consecutive weeks in a row. Um, great to see you. What a busy week again. Um, again, interesting. You know, we we're so packed up with events in June, and we've got our big Super Cloud event next week. I've had I've had dozens of interviews kind of circulating around this Super Cloud, multi-cloud, cloud-native market. Um, and the, and the tsunami of apps coming from AI. And while at the same time, the economy um, is really kind of really not doing well in tech um, on the startup side, funding is down to an all time low. Um, you're seeing all kinds of activity around um, uh, VCs trying to offload the companies that aren't performing. There's no real accu hire market, which means no one's acquiring some of these uh, startups. And uh, I think, as I predicted this week, you're going to see some startups falling out of the sky next year as fume dates come close. Fume date meaning the date of when they run out of gas and and capital. And this, there's no acquisition market for talent for accu hires. Then you're going to see a lot of people in the streets. Um, Lena Khan is at it again. I can't wait to hear your perspective. But uh, she got pretty much hit over the head by the courts that, that ruled that Microsoft's acquisition is going to go through. Um, and then Broadcom VMware is in the news in the register article today saying they need rescuing. Um, I call BS in that article. I think it's just fodder for what everyone knows. And it's just to kind of placate the EU and the UK. Um, all kinds of stuff. The Activision deals, I mentioned the FTC, that was a big deal. I want, I want to get into that, not just on a rant, Dave, but just overall impact to like how the lack of understanding of tech, um, is going on. And of course we got, um, AWS summit in New York city. I'm going to be down there. You have a big event going on here around storage. We got super cloud next week. What's going two on? Two events, two events, one on storage, one on data. We got super cloud. You know, you, I was just, uh, I was just on with an investor, John, and he was telling me that he's seeing deals that are getting done where they're getting VCs to invest, signing term sheets. And then by the time that the round is about to close, they're already disrupted because somebody else is getting funded. That is, <laughs> is, he says, I've never seen anything like it. So it's like, you got to be careful out there as an investor as to where you're putting your money. I mean, I know they're just sprinkling it around. And yeah, I can't wait to get into Lena Khan whiffing a, yet again. I think she's 0 for 4 now. Um, yeah. she probably should be dropped down to the minors, but but she's she's she keeps going. We'll talk about that. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Busy week, busy security. Uh, the gen the, I, I mean, I just love the gen AI thing. And again, I, I I didn't mention it at the top, but it's now a week into Threads. Five days, they hit a hundred million. Uh, I did not call that. I'm meeting my words on the app because I said there's no way they're going to be faster growth than ChatGPT, um, and I was wrong. Um, a lot of people are saying that they're throttling back the numbers because they're afraid. As I pointed out on the first day of launch, that there's a monopoly power action happening. The fact that that app can launch so fast. Um, if you're meta right now, you've got to be thinking um, um, about Monopoly. I mean, the fact that they did that has, you know, besides the fact that they did a good, perfect launch is the power of the meta. I mean, that's just unbelievable. And what can they do next? So this comes back down to the narrative you and I have had mid over the many years on the queue, going back to say 2015, when we really started talking about, you know, cloud scale as a competitive advantage. And I believe that you can, you're going to start to see the haves and have nots emerge where the notion of scale as a differentiation, a moat will be huge. And I think meta is a great example of this, with this threads thing. Now, I've already seen the engagement drop off on Threads, but still, they got 100 million. They're probably hiding the numbers. They did leverage the Instagram cold start graphs data for that people can move over and do it. But, um, well, I think John, I mean, six months ago, everybody's like, ah, oh, Meta's screwed. They're spending all this money on, on Metaverse. I mean, I as well said, so just kind of missed the Metaverse. You missed AI. But look at them now. I mean, they, are, they haven't even turned on the advertising machine for Threads. And 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 Zuckerberg caught staff, and he you know, probably looked at what Elon did and said, "You know what? I can I can just cut staff, and, and people are still going to advertise with me." I mean, they're making so much money, and they have so many other levers that they can turn. Yeah, I mean, Facebook all of a sudden is looking really good, or Meta. As you saw in the Wall Street Journal today, they had an article on this on how the insiders talking about the OG mark coming back. Um, you know, I pointed that out when they first launched, they got too many knobs to kill Twitter. Twitter has no options, but one, 
uh, that is that is the coming kind of lock in the developers and win win back the day but that might be a sinking ship i don't and know i mean uh, uh, twitter's i like twitter i think twitter's better now since elon took it over i mean I, a lot of people don't like it it's check marks and stuff but it seems like conversations are better and I, I i mean i still like it i like threads i like twitter i i'm like one of these all above guys john why why not use them all yeah, I mean, you got to post all, all of them. I'm, I've been posting, but I think I think threads definitely could wear out. Again, I've always called the nightclub factor, Dave, and like the hot new nightclub, and then it gets boring, and then it's like, okay, no one wants Twitter. Um, I was talking to some of our younger folks in our team here at the Cube, and you know, like ah, I don't really want a Twitter app. I'm, you know, I have Instagram. I really don't want. I don't really into tweeting. So, uh, meanwhile, TikTok's out there, and you got Reels. So, Twitter. I mean. Really, we need another Twitter. We mentioned that last time, so I don't want to rehash it. But I, I think generally, like, if it's, I think it's going to come down to if Elon can win the media back, the ones that left, Twitter will never die. They'd be too big to die. I said that all over and over again. But mm -hmm. you know, self-inflicted wounds could could be a wild card. Elon's uh, un, unpredictable. But and I don't know if we need another Twitter. But the, the affinity with Instagram is just so easy to sign up. I know, you know, my daughter is like this influencer in TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. And of course, she's loving threads like a lot of these influencers are because it's just so easy to bring your social graph over. I mean, you've got a lot just, of followers on threads. I noticed I bumped her up the, the other day. Yeah. I, yeah. I because she just she just basically you know showed up and everybody started following her. And, and, and so it's it's so easy for her to now find another channel that has an adjacency um so i and i think you know as much smaller extent you know we in enterprise tech do the same thing i mean i've enjoyed my interactions on threads and it has it has taken away from some of the time i've spent on other platforms i have to admit it i mean i tried tweeting at some of the journalists that are giving you know fawning results um praise over threads uh mainly because they hate twitter taylor lorenz is not is very transparent about her feelings about twitter uh and the toxic nature over there and the goose and and, and the the misfires but, you know, um, I asked the question, and I'd like to have one some of the reports that are on that beat answer the question. What are the active uniques of Instagram? Because I think Instagram is going to get penalized. The people going to threads, I mean, I've already noticed, personally, my Instagram usage is way down. Not that I was an active user, but threads, you know. Yeah, it's, me too. It's, it's like, okay, so so the, if, if that's the case, Zuckerberg is cross-subsidizing threads from instagram okay and when you cross subsidize that's a competitive strategy just to kill twitter so think about that bet he wants to get 50 percent of the town square market so bad that he's willing to subsidize and cannibalize instagram to subsidize threads and you know how that is dave you cannibalize something you take from here instagram leverage the um the social graph the onboarding ease of use click 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 you're in was phenomenal again perfect launch for these guys yep. uh, and then there you go they're subsidizing threads and cannibalizing or hurting instagram that's smart but also kind of evil genius at the same time so you know i ballsy. think, uh, I, really I think ballsy. It, it, the meta policy people gotta be gotta be saying to zuckerberg slow down we gotta camouflage our land grab we can't let the government see us use this power that we have over the marketplace and meanwhile, they get the whole press corps, you know, begging for followers. So, you know, they're controlling its power. And, you know, I've been asking questions and I've been pretty overt uh, on, on the app saying, hey, you know, is this another nightclub? Is it the power? Okay, the cold start problem. Is that a feature or a bug or an advantage with Monopoly? And so these are questions. And, and again, if the case is Instagram is losing daily active uniques, then there it is. They're using Instagram as a as a as a lever to propel threads. That is that, means bundle, they, is that bundling, John? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of clever. Well, the 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 the, uh, the, the meta people are like, no, no, no. It, you have to download the app. Okay, true, but the onboarding is literally Instagram backend. So yeah, you're technically downloading software. But all the back end work, graph data, username, and that's why you can't delete your username on threads without deleting Instagram. Right. 
So there it is. Instant Unpacked. moat. <laughs> Instant lock-in. <laughs> it is evil genius. And meanwhile, Lena Khan's distracted with Microsoft Activision and, and OpenAI. We'll get to that, I know. I, I, Lena Khan, the, the, by the way, what we just were talking about, I think is a little bit above Lena Khan's pay grade intellectually. So I don't think she can actually grok that. Her focus is on, on other things that are just so pedestrian and not I, even relevant. I, I don't think it's a matter of her intellect because she's super smart. I think it's a matter of her. I didn't say being smart is one thing, but being uh, uh, you know putting but, things together is another. But, but you say yeah, above her intellect, but whatever. But I, I I think it's 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 her dogma that is blinding her. Um, I mean, she's certainly smart enough to figure this out. She's just so she's like a dog and a bone going after you know these. <laughs> These attempts to take down big tech, we'll we'll get to it. Unless you want to get to it now, I'm like ready to go. Go, go. go, let's go, go. Let's go, leading. Okay, on. so let's let's look at the inst the the Activision Microsoft, right? So she loses that. So this is like oh for four now. After you know Meta tried to acquire or did acquire and successfully, um, the let you know the last thing she took took to court. She said in 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 public here. She said if you never bring the hard cases. There's a severe cost to that. It can lead to stagnation. Okay, is stagnation, is that a word that describes tech? No. <laughs> Impacts of consolidation. She says, I'm worried about lower wages for workers, diminished innovation, and lower levels of service quality. Again, does tech have lower wages? I mean, the average wage in you know the U.S. is probably 55, 60,000. You know, tech, much higher than that. Diminished innovation in tech? No. Lower levels of service and quality? Look at the NPS scores of Apple. And then this woman, Jennifer Rye, who's a senior litigation analyst for Bloomberg, said the FTC needs to pick better battles. And so, so what did she do? Right after she lost the Activision ruling, she sends you know to open AI, chat GPT is a target of pro by the F FTC. One question asked the uh, company to describe in detail the extent to which you have taken steps to address or mitigate risks that your large language model products could generate statements about real individuals that are false, misleading, or disparaging. So here's another phishing expedition, John. They sent a 20-page letter to OpenAI with 49 queries with 17 document demands. Well, OpenAI was not designed, or, or ChatGPT was not designed not to hallucinate. If you're using that to get the truth, you're using it the wrong way. She'll be <laughs> using it for ideation, summarization. I mean, it's just, it's just another, to me, misguided attempt by the FTC to inject its dogma into the industry. It's, and, and, and I'm, I'm, they're zealots. It's just, you've heard my rant on this before. I, I just, I don't know. What do you think about this? Is it just more of the same nonsense? What, when is it going to end? I, I think it actually exposes um, the hypocrisy of the FTC and Lena Khan. I think, I think she's just, her ideology and her worldview is warped uh, from reality. And I don't think um, she understands how technology works um, she might be super academically smart. I think she went to Yale or something like that. She wrote some yeah. papers. She was anti Amazon. And I see that. I mean, I can understand that point of view, but you know, I, I just don't agree with it at all. I think she's on a crusade and um, will steamroll whatever she can um, to change distribution of wealth and how our economy works and capitalism. So, you know, I just think, you know, sometimes you got to let the free market do its thing. Now, I'm not saying don't have oversight. If anything, I think tech needs to have more oversight or not oversight, more understanding holistically as it, it, it hits all aspects of our lives. I mean, the digital transformation and or the digitization of our world is happening. And that means data is everything. Security is everything. Privacy is everything. These are features of a fabric not a, you know, some canned siloed thing. So, you know, I think technology was once an industry where a bunch of nerds in California and in certain parts of the United States were working on cool stuff and they'd roll it out to the world and people would be happy, people would make money and get rich. Now you're seeing in the past three years, more unicorns. Remember when unicorns was like three of them? Now there's like 300 of them. Unicorns being companies worth over a billion dollars. The surge in the market uh, has been good. <laughs> and, and so you know it's zombie like, zombie corns is the new term though right 
<laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the world's changing. We got a we got a headwind, and you know, the macroeconomics we'll get to in a second. But I think you know, the FTC has an obligation to understand how um, ec economics work and how we trade and how things work. And when you're in a digital economy where you have concepts like digital twins, something that you're talking a lot about, and you're and you're breaking analysis around the Uberization, what Uber is, all companies going to look like Uber with some sort of complex new digital uh, infrastructure and software, AI, generative AI applications are surging. I heard almost 50% of all code being committed in GitHub now is uh, built by generative AI machines. Um, yep. And so more and more information overloads coming, you're going to have uh, fatigue, you're going to have misinformation. There's so many bigger battles to fight to win the overall war to create an economy that everyone has access to and uh, where people can can be entrepreneurial, whether you're an individual uh, living in the corner of, of of some area or in a corporation uh, and innovating inside a company and and disrupting. So they got to do that differently. And I just don't like what they're doing. I mean, okay, you know, even the Broadcom, VMware um, conversations that are happening, we saw that piece out today and it was just, it was, it was just all FUD. It was just a story that was ridiculous. I mean, yeah, Broadcom is going to cut sales and marketing, but you know, VMware had no cloud, Dave. There was no threat to anybody. Of course, they had. I mean, and had a product, so it was all ridiculous. Um, so again, the world's changing, and I think you know these bigger mergers are going to be good. But you know, I'm more worried about the metas of the world than than Broadcom. To be honest with you, and Microsoft oh. and gaming. Come on. Well, but so Microsoft, the Activision thing. I, I just want to say one more thing about that. The EU basically was the one who initially blocked this, and they worked it out with Microsoft and Microsoft said, look at the concern you have is over Call of Duty and us restricting access to Call of Duty. We'll agree to make Call of Duty available to anybody who, who wants it, not, not doesn't have to come to our platform to get it. You said, all right, cool, boom. That's the consent decree. You, you, you abide by that, you violate that, we're gonna come after you, but if you, you know, play by the rules, no problem, check. So we figure, okay, hey, it's good enough for the EU, it's gotta be good enough for the US, no, not for Lena Khan. So because she's so focused on changing the policies and agenda, um, and she, in my opinion, she's going outside her swim lane. I mean, this is really, she, I don't even know if she has congressional authority to do some of this stuff, but she just says, no, she rejects that outright. I'm taking it to court. And now that she's even appealing the ruling, just to bust balls. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> it's like, it's not right. And then, you know, the other thing you're talking about 50% uh, of the code now in GitHub is, is, is AI generated. I was just talking to Jeff Jonas on this week's breaking analysis. You know what he said to me? What? He had a great line. He goes, Dave, entropy is winning. And by entropy, he's talking about, you know, the entropy, second law of thermodynamics for you took in college, right? And it's like the degree of randomness and or, or, or disorder. And he's referring to in data and basically saying, you know, there's so much, AI going on and so much now randomness created by machines. It's probably the, there's more, probably more machine created data now than there is, you know, human data. Entropy's winning. I, I love just, that. Line. I just had a conversation too with the CTO this morning of CrowdStrike. Okay. Uh, Ilya Zetserv. Um, he, um, super smart guy. We're talking about the human plus AI is better than AI. And we were talking about chess, you know, grandmasters in the old days were dominant and people who couldn't get there are going to get there with uh, AI. And we were talking about in cybersecurity. It's not just skills gap. You're going to see new people come in that weren't, that couldn't crack the the, the code to get the, the big jobs because in security, you have to be like a top-notch coder or computer science or math person or just super smart. Um, and now with AI, you can get people who come in who don't have to know those disciplines and can be up and running and perform at that grand master level, defending adversaries. So you're going to start to see this, uh, and I said it before in the pod, multiplayer gaming like vibe where, where technology and humans work together. I mean, I, you know, I've, I play video games with my kids used to, but you know, they're good. I I'm terrible. So <laughs> it's not helping me so but they're good and so they're playing the game the game's available but certain people are going to be really really good at 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 working with machines and some aren't but they can get in the game 
AI cool. will help people do things they've never done before. And it's going to help areas that were once hard to get into starting companies, being a security guru, whatever elite positions, grandmaster chess player, you're going to start to see a second tier of, of, of excellence come in quickly from people who have that unique skill, but not maybe the total package to do it standalone. But with AI, that person could propel to excellence. And I think that's going to change the game. You're going to start to see new, new shit happening, new startups, new people rolling into positions that, that are going to be, wow, mm. that person's like operating at the tier one level of performance. And of course, the people who are actually in those performance positions are going to oh. get more productive Right. So this is what Elia Crowdstrike and I were talking about. And, and it went from a security conversation to data. So data is everywhere. It's data native now. Everything's about data. And and AI is just going to eat that up for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it's going to be incredible um, uh, power dynamic. And I think entropy, opportunity, wealth creation, and people like Lena Khan get in the way of that, in my opinion. So that's why, you know, kind of tie her back in these kind of protectionists kind of like let's equalize the playing field the playing field's already equalized with democracy so to me give people opportunity now with the technology shift that's happening this is democratizing and creating opportunities all we got to do is give people access to it so you know i'm pro access anti-protectionism in terms of letting innovation flourish and i think uh, at the end of the day that kpi that benchmark is about entrepreneurship who's starting companies Who's building stuff? Who's creating value? And can they get paid for it? Does it create uh, value for the uh, for people and the, and the world? So, John, a um, couple things. A while back, I don't think you did this show with me. No, I was like John Walls or something on the Cube. Gary Kasparov came on. We were down in New York City, and you remember he got beat by the IBM. I think it was Blue Jean, the Blue Jean supercomputer. When it beat him, this is years ago, way before Jeopardy. So people might not remember Gary Kasparov. He he was like the greatest chess player in the world, you know, grand grandmaster, like number one. The guy was amazing. So when he lost to the computer, he's such a baller. He, he said, I'm going to beat the computer. So what he did was he created this tournament, and I think it still runs today, where he beat the computer with a combination, to exactly to your point, with humans and machines. So the human plus the machine beats the machine. So he created this whole tournament where you, you get to use a machine and humans. So the greatest chess player in the world is not yeah. a machine. It's machines plus humans. So that's kind of, kind of cool. Um, the other thing is, you know, you're talking about, we're talking about Lena Khan and innovation. I think there's similar things going on with the SEC and, in and, and Gary Gensler, who's trying to kill crypto in the U S now, I'm not saying that he shouldn't go after you get frauds like FTX and you got Binance breaking all the rules, but you know, then you got Coinbase trying to figure out what to do. And I, I granted, they're trying to do a little bit of a reach around, but they're pushing crypto out of the country. You know, if you look at what happened in Japan, now Japan is not, you don't think of Japan as the place to go for innovation and, and crypto, but they were the only country in the world where the, the, the FTX uh, uh, investors were able to get their money back because Japan put down the proper controls. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's the place for innovation, but that's the right model for crypto is to actually partner up with the organizations that are providing these services yeah. and create rules that can be followed so that you do protect the investor, not that you just kick them out. These big Gensler's trying to basically, to my mind, just push them out of the country. And I don't think that's the right thing for innovation, especially in, in the U.S., well, this is what this is what the FTC. By the way, I love your rants too. I kind of agree with most of them, if not all of them. But the FTC plays a critical role in our economy um, on that on their one little lane that they should be staying in. On the other side, you have um, our government with the fiscal and monetary policies. They do a good job. You can see more. People, Wall Street's got a good barometer and as a good interaction and, and a balancing force between policymakers in the Fed. So. Inflation numbers just came out. I had some talking points on this. Um, you know, it's it's down, right? So um, their target inflation is 2%. It's getting closer. It looks like a soft landing might be there. So it, it, it's going to keep rates high for now, but they think if it continues to go on a downward trend, that could be that soft landing. Again, we hope companies don't fall out of the sky in 2024, but I think they will based upon some of the data I'm hearing on fume dates, you know, uh, and the capital markets here in the Valley relative to the tech startup scene. So macro 
inflation down, soft landing possible. But the big uh, red flags to me is the backlog of lack of IPOs. There's a drought now, 18 months and counting for an IPO, tech IPOs, enterprise or or you know SaaS or software IPO, and significantly down and prolong that absence is going to be longer if it continues to get suckier. And then the second thing, companies aren't going public. So then the next thing is, what do you got to do to go public? We already know that the um, um, valuations are dropping in the capital markets for early stage startups almost by half. The uh, Series A hurdle to get a Series A financing is higher than it was um, to, than it was when money was for almost free. So you're going to have this whole who goes public when it is, is going to be a tsunami, everyone going at once, you know, just flooding the equity markets. And then how, what metrics do you need to be ready to go public? So, you know, you got soft landing possible, still inflation, backlog of IPOs, no liquidity, and headwinds there. And then the readiness, what, what is good mean if the markets are changing so fast with AI and other things. So you're going to see a, a shift of, a power, in my opinion, on these pre-public companies. If you're not Databricks with billions on the bank or some of these AI companies that have raised a billion dollars, which is like going public, you're going to be screwed. I mean, it's going to be a tough market. It's it's going to be interesting. And the insiders in Silicon Valley are all saying that the seed investors, those early stage investors, the Series A's, or are trying to get the Series B or B trying to get the Series C, that are struggling. There's no I there's no M and A market for Accu hires right now, and it's not because cash is a premium. So if you have cash right now, you are in a great position as an innovator. And so when the government starts meddling, like the FTC, uh, especially with the big whales, it's going to have an impact on um, a trickle effect to to startups. So you know my that's my view on it. I look at the, the in the in the trenches. What's the per barometer for the startups? And then what's happening with the big whales like Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, who have all that power, Meta, Google, those guys can't move fast enough. So they're pretty much easy to predict. But the startup scene, that's the proxy, in my opinion, where the economy is. Let me ask you a question. Sure. N NASDAQ through June 30th was up 32% year to date. Did Databricks miss a window in which it could have done an IPO? In other words, instead of waiting, you know, waiting for the perfect time, could it have gone out? and taking advantage of some of the froth in the market and this little, little slingshot rebound in the first half of this year? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, well, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how I feel about that because um, as all the people know in the Valley here, um, there's been liquidity going on inside Databricks for a long time. Their last valuation was $38 billion. That was their last round of funding. I think they raised over a billion dollars. So they have enough capital. I mean, the point of going public is to quote, raise money and then get liquidity. So if you can raise the kind of money that they have, like a billion dollars, you got, and you have kind of a secondary market developing. And I know the valuation is much lower than that. I've heard, you know, ranges significantly lower than 38 billion. Low twenties, let's say, right. Let's okay. just say, let's just say 25 billion, just to use the number um, or 20 billion. That would be an $18 billion discount. Um, but there's liquidity happening for Databricks stock. We know that because we heard and confirmed rumblings of that in the in the rumor mill. So when we heard from people in the street saying, yeah, I sold some Databricks stock. So that means the VCs are taking their percentage out, putting it into their returns, locking in their position, and playing with house money on the forward basis and hoping for upside. Because I think there's going to be a hell of a lot of upside on Databricks, um, given this comparable to Snowflake. So well, I don't. I, I think the answer would be, I think they're fine. I mean, either way, they'd still be, and in, in, in my opinion, I think knowing the Databricks team, it's almost a pleasure not to be public. No more filing. <laughs> you can, you know, they got a 30 day shot clock, right? So you got the cash, you got the liquidity. Why do you go public? I, why, I you know, why? so I hear you. And, but it reminds me of not, not that, not that the company is the same, but it reminds me of Cloudera. Remember Cloudera, Cloudera took all that money from Intel. Mike Olson would say, well, we don't need to go public. Well, it's like sometimes you, you, you take it when you don't need it. And the, so to me, and I hear you, they don't need the cash necessarily. But to me, Databricks being a public company would expand its presence in the market. And they've got the momentum. I, I actually think had they been able to go public in like late May, early June, I think they would have had a kick-ass IPO. They could have got, I bet you they could have got back above and i'm sure they had advisors so i'm probably full of shit here but they probably could have got back to their earlier you know their last valuation and maybe had the market you know run it up now of course it doesn't do them any good if the you know 
if if they go out and let's say have 35 38 billion dollar valuation they take that money and then the market runs up like snowflake did remember snowflake everybody was saying left a lot of money in the table but i would say that was actually I good i, mean, I don't I, think I, they I, did well, well, I mean, technically they did because the stock ran up to like 300, you know, and they, it was 120 was the IPO price. So they could have, in theory, gotten a lot more. But I say that's good because it lets investors have a little bit of room to run. So the guys who got in at 120, you know, they're, they were in the money throughout this whole, you know, downturn. And so I actually like that when a company, you know, gives the investors a little opportunity to make some cash instead of just all the insiders. But, and, you know, like it's a good example of the cloud air. If the markets got hot market, yeah, they, if cloud air went public, I would, I think they would have done much better because they would have had tailwind on value and um, they would have been transparent. So they would have to do better. And the market was hot in the stock market. If you go back and look at when they would have gone public, um, it was a much different market. They would have hit, rode that growth. Instead, and they waited and it was kind of a meh IPO, right? I mean, that's hard to tell. I think Cloudera didn't have the traction um, that um, Databricks has. I mean, Databricks, True. it was, I would say it would be called the Cloudera um, if before Spark took off. But right yeah, now and that's why, I, I, that's why I don't, I didn't want to compare the two companies and their business model. Databricks is a much better business model, but it's just in terms of the, the timing of the IPO and the narrative of, hey, we don't have to go public. And I get like yeah. Michael Dell, we don't want to be in the quarterly, you know, quarterly shot clock. But I think there are other benefits to going public. Databricks has to go public at some point in time. Well, I mean, th this is this is the thing. IPO drought is interesting um, dynamics. So we got to watch that. So I think the Fed rate is going to impact that. And then, you know, what does it take to go public? I mean, long-term long revenue numbers, what's your growth rate going to be? What's your ARR? Those benchmarks, which was once maybe lower hurdle, are going to be much higher um, or you have to have a seriously hyped and or winning AI strategy. So I just think it's going to be very interesting. And, and, and I think one thing that's not talked a lot about is the market of private companies with no M&A market, you know, and, you know, I hate to be gloom and doom and I, I hope I'm wrong, but if you're looking at your runway and you have a fume date, that's the date you run out of money when your company is dead or has to give up and shut down. That's when you have to kind of let the company die. And if there's no buyers, that's the end of the company. So, you know, that's the Series A, Series B's companies that aren't getting the traction in the new normal. So, you know, pivoting's happening big time. People are working hard to pivot, but if they can't make it, you're going to see teams of people on the streets uh, and it's going to be an opportunity for this next wave of AI developers. So, so I think it's the, you know, you know what they say in Silicon Valley, the, the, the startups that don't make it become fertilizer for the next batch. Um, uh, so that's, that's interesting dynamic. And I think it's playing out right now. Yeah, just, I can I'll close this out on this. I just, I just wonder, you know, what is it that we don't know? I mean, Snowflake's got a nearly $60 billion valuation. And we've talked about if you take out the AWS revenue out of the Snowflake revenue, it's very possible that Snowflake and, and Databricks have a similar sort of revenue model. And maybe, maybe Databricks just isn't ready to go public. Maybe they don't have the profitability profile. You know, they trickle out. They're they're pretty transparent for a private company, but then they but they trickle out like any private company, little bits and pieces of information. But you know, one wonders maybe they're just maybe they're just not ready. I mean, I'm dying to see their S one sort of unpack that thing. Yeah. So, well, anyway, I'm ex I'm excited to uh, talk about um, the the antitrust bus, which we just did, but the security stuff. We got the super cloud event coming on, and I think the AI story just continues to surge. And again, the title of our super cloud event on Tuesday, the 18th and 19th, is security plus AI. And I think it's interesting that on the security landscape, Dave, I know you follow this closely. The market's changing, right? And um, security never goes away. It's one of those things that will be a standard thing. And I just interviewed Merritt Bear, who's now at Lacework as a CISO. Um, she's uh, saying that you know. Data as a cost center, when companies say that, means it's not a good move. <laughs> in other words, if you don't right. have solve, if you don't have security in everything you do with digital, yep. then you're going to be compromised and you're going to be breached. So, I give you a, so, a little preview. I get some fresh ETR data. So during the pandemic, John, machine learning, containers, cloud and RPA were the big four. They were the big four where spending velocity was the highest. And then in, in when Ukraine and inflation and the Fed started to tighten, 
people just started to not not be as enthused about AI. So if you look at where AI went on the spending momentum, it it dropped significantly. It went from like over 60%, what's called net score, which is an indicator of spending. 60% of the customers were net customers were spending more than than less. And it dropped down to well, uh, you know, below 40%. And and then after ChatGPT, the thing rocketed back up. It's now no, the number one sector. So if you look at a month before ChatGPT was announced, the sector was bottomed and it's been rocketing since. And its percentage of the market in terms of, if you look at the percentage of customers that said you were spending on AI versus the divided by the total, it's like doing this, okay? Now, if you look at AWS, Microsoft, Google, and OpenAI, AWS sort of bottomed out and was was declining during that same sort of period. And then after it announced Bedrock, it started to go. So AWS went from number one because it had all the SageMaker action. And then Microsoft, in terms of net uh, spending momentum, Microsoft was number two, Google was was number three. Open, open AI wasn't even on the in the survey. They were were nobody even heard heard of them, right? If you go now post Chat GPT, Open AI has by far the highest spending momentum and by far the most mentions, like eighty seven percent net score versus Microsoft now number two because they cut the line sixty eight percent. AWS actually went up, but it's now number three. At 60%, and Google went up, but 52%. So the rising tide lifted all ships, and the percent or the number in the survey of folks saying they're doing AI, leaning into AI, spending on AI, all went up. So you got the big, big three clouds plus open AI, and then as well, you got all these other companies, Anthropic, Data Robot, uh, Anaconda, you know, all rising. And then to Jeff Jonas's point today, then there's all this AI you don't even see. It's just all embedded, yeah. which brings me back, John, to security, because all these security yeah. companies all have AI embedded into their platforms, and that's what we're going to be talking about next week at SuperCloud 3. Yeah, great, great, great data teaser there. And I'm looking forward to seeing that data. It does point to what we've been saying about, you know, even our early conversations, can open AI have a competitive advantage? Remember, I, I said if the scale is going to help them, and it looks like it has. But what's ironic about open AI, it's less open than everything else. It's right. like closed AI. Um, it's a large language model. And what's happening is there's a trend of smaller language models emerging. So um, you have a concept that um, is going to come out in our SuperCloud event uh, called Data Fusion. So a company called Vicinity, who we interviewed, are going to be uh, speaking in our ecosystem section of our of our event. Vicinity is a company that is essentially is came out of the DoD and the Department of Defense and government contracts, where they've mastered the art of understanding how data works and how they can fuse it together in real time, and that's going to be the, the interaction of data models, kind of like uh, our our uh, data development environment. We we've been talking about for thirteen years. It's happening. Data is now a a formulaic element, like almost like chemistry, almost like a periodic tables, you know, kind of reaction. You're going to be blending things together and data is going to connect and it's going to fuse and interact with other data. And this phenomenon called data fusion is legit. And I think you're going to start to see a highly uh, availability, high availability of data, okay, being thrust into applications that have never been there before other than a query turn get a call back it's like you know like maybe the old database days you access the database get a response um you're going to see data fusion become a massive thing uh, and companies like hammerspace um vast data these storage companies are going to be have to be enablers for this new data fusion trend because the data developers are out there now and it's going to be more and more of that. So, you know, all that's it's, it's radical, radical change. And I think this is why people are freaking out. I mean, if you go look at, uh, uh, again, news we can talk about here that kind of hits this point of, you know, old versus new, the um, the unions representing all the Hollywood actors and performers have gotten decided to go on strike. First, it was the writers. Now it's the actors supporting the brethren, right? So, okay, the writers and the actors are on Hollywood are striking against the studios. You know why? They're pissed off about the streaming rights. They're worried about their their asset being deep faked or um, their their rights to the content being misused or not being compensated for. And so, you know, if you can't innovate, sue. This is a huge topic. 
John. Let's let's talk about it. Yeah, um, I mean, because I mean, cause, I mean, what's the choice? They have to be part of the equation. The human creatives. I mean, I tweeted. Actually, did tweet. I threaded this. What do you call it when you thread? <laughs> you tweet. You know, you threaded it. Yeah, cre creatives are valuable, right? And this is why the machines, humans plus machines, is key. So what's interesting is is that they're striking, but it's they're striking for the wrong reasons. I think so. Um, I, I don't. I don't know how I feel, but I do, do think they should have striked. I think the actors should have supported the writers. Uh, personally, I think that's solidarity. But I think the bigger picture is, what are they fighting for? Well, so I heard Iger. Well, first of all, I think the 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 union workers feel like, hey, during COVID, we we stepped up, and these streaming services made a boatload of money. And they've stuffed it in their pockets of their CEOs. And, you know, you've heard the narrative. Bob Iger is on TV this week saying this is absolutely the worst time to strike. These guys just don't get it. So they're, they're miles apart. And I think the, the, the workers are saying, screw that. It's our time. We got to get paid. And so my, and my understanding is they're obviously concerned about AI and locking in an agreement now. Because if you're, let's say you're an extra on a site. I was talking to Ken Schiffman about this today. And if you're an extra on a site and you're getting paid for your, you know, for showing up every day and walking around the set. And I know people that were, I know I have friends who are extras in that movie, Little Women, because it was filmed in my hometown. And uh, they would, you know, they'd walk around all day and, you know, they'd be there for, you know, eight, nine hours just for a, a one minute or 30 second shoot, regardless. They'd have to be there that day, the next day, every time they shot that scene. And they're worried that they're saying, okay, they can just take that facial image, pay them once, and then replicate it whenever else they need it, and to dramatically cut the pay of, of the extra, of the actors. And so they're saying, wait a minute. No, no, we have to renegotiate this and lock in our rights, our IP rights. It's a moving train, though. I mean, it's a, first of all, I think that's fine. I mean, hey, if you can replicate, automate that. Then, then that's I, I wouldn't. If you're automating, say redundancy, I mean, it's to be an extra. I mean, really, okay. Now, the bigger issue is the is the talent, the talent, right? So, um, Brendan's texting us, <laughs> a producer, uh, Bob well, Iger. By the, Bob Iger, by the way, saying that while he's on a billionaire retreat in Sun Valley. Exactly, uh, so. Brendan's right. <laughs> but wait a minute for a second. Wait a second. So the the I'm, I mean, if you're getting paid for your to be there and they're taking your face and then replicating it why shouldn't you get rights to that i mean i, I know it's not as big as the creatives I, I agree but let's start at the bottom and work up i mean why shouldn't you get rights on that just like you would if you wrote a song i think you should i mean i'm not against it. i'm just saying automating physical presence is going to happen right so i mean look at this you know we always say do you want to fight fashion Right. So the, the, the trend here is, is the trend their friend? Obviously not, because that's why they're distance apart between, you know, the tone deaf executives and the talent. But the talent also have to know what they're fighting for, too. And I think, you know, I just don't understand the frame. I understand the premise of the following thing. Talent is better than creative is better than mechanism, right? Meaning the, the industry itself. So I would say that I, I would say AI will help and should benefit talent more. Now, the problem is, is the power of the studios to get the money and they got the control. So what ultimately breaks this, in my opinion, is a new vendor, a new way. Um, so, you know, it's like the clash of the titans. And ultimately, the, I think what will solve this is uh, new talent will say, screw the, the middleman, go direct. Uh, and look at, I mean, I was just talking about this about the YouTubers, like, uh, you know, the, the uh, Mr. Beast, you know, he makes most of his money, not so much from YouTube. He makes it from the brand deals he does and his own, like, um, he did a, a thing, um, some takeoffs, he does his own productions now. So he's got billions of fault, uh, views on his stuff, but YouTube's paying him jack shit for that. You're talking about um... Mr. Beast. <laughs> he's the, he's the big time guy on YouTube. We actually saw him yeah, at the Palo Alto gym, actually. I yeah, saw the him big time he's producer, out. right? Yeah, he's a big yeah, he's time a, he's, producer. He's an influencer. Yeah, but but isn't didn't he get his start as a as a producer in writing songs? And am I confusing him? Yeah, confusing him. He's a YouTuber. 
my point is YouTube monetization and Twitter just started trying to pay their monetization. It's mostly right wing people, but this idea of paying talent in these new platforms like YouTube and Twitter and these uh, bottoms up organic growth, not the big studios, they're all struggling. It's always been a controversy with, with paying them. And the monetization I've always claimed has been ridiculously low. I mean, YouTube pays people on a CPM like basis, which is old school banner advertising. So I think, I think the entire monetization industry from the people that have the power of the audience, like the YouTubes, like the Twitches have to rethink how people get paid for the value that they bring from as a talent. And um, YouTube, gets away with it because it's the only game in town they have massive scale and they can get away with it because the the the, the talent basically cuts side deals that's how they get paid and so you-, you know hollywood is its own little racket so but the studios are are there so you know it's it's interesting how you know this creator culture is emerging Dave. because you know remember talk about democratization if you told me 25 years ago that you know people can go on youtube and get billions of views being no name I'd, I'd be like, what? YouTube just upload videos from my kids' Little League game. But, but well, now it's like it is new TV. But I think the, the guys like Iger, um, by the way, I'm a fan, completely underestimated the power of user-generated user content. And that, that people are spending more time on TikTok, more time on social media, Instagram, now threads, wherever, than they are watching, you know, and they're, and they're cutting cords. So... And and these studios went out and spent billions to create this content, and they made out in this little short time frame. But look, if you're spending your money on TV ads and print ads at the expense of social platforms, it, you're totally missing the boat. It's where it's where all the action is. It's it's always amazing to me to see how much money is still spent on places where it's against the fashion. I mean, I, I, I would be doubling down on, I'd be spending money on Instagram threads when it becomes available, Twitter, why not Facebook, you know, obviously, and, and YouTube for sure. I mean, that's, that's where you're going to get better return and you can measure it. By the way, I mean, just as a side note on the whole Hollywood right, Sarah Silverman sued OpenAI for copyright infringement for her right. Material. Yes. So right. again, this is going to not go away. This come up. This came up in our podcast early on when we started talking about open uh, generative AI license rights on software. So not just not just software license rights. Now you got content license rights. So you know it's going to be very interesting to see. Again, this points to a new generation. I've been saying this for years. You know me, my rant. This cultural shift is here. Um, a revolution is coming how people get paid, how technology is deployed, and the skirmish um, encapsulates, this Hollywood strike encapsulates the difference between, you know, the the people who are building the, the content value, the creative, and the middleman, the studios. Now, they have the money and the power. So so I think there's going to be that tension, and ultimately it's blocking things, but the power of the of the society will push that, that blocker out of the way. And I think you'll see new solutions. How fast? I don't know. But all I can tell you is that I've seen this movie before. When you have an incumbent who's not going to give up the reins to the power and this growth and this and there's this a market there, new stuff will emerge. I think YouTube's got a great opportunity with this. Um, I think um, Amazon's got a great opportunity with this. Um, these bigger platforms that are kind of the new school could come in and mop up the talent. So- well. I, it's going to be very interesting to watch because, you know, we're in the content business. We watch this very carefully, but we don't have unions, but we're digital. Um, but, you know, we're not producing Hollywood hits either. So, but yeah, talent should get paid, period. But but your point about can't fight fashion is right on. And you know, I think that you're going to have this debate, this fight, this this strike is going to go on and it's just going to further hurt the old old guard, if you will. User-generated content, the the talent is there. The cost structure is superb. Uh, the attention span is shifting in that direction, and it doesn't. This whole thing doesn't spell. I mean, I think the the both sides are basically going <laughs> to create their own demise at the ex- <laughs> and, and and they're going to lose uh, to to user generated content. And I want to just say one other thing. We were talking about uh, earlier about uh, OpenAI, the FTC probe back in. 
January after SuperCloud 2, you, Sarbjeet, and I did a breaking analysis on, you know, will OpenAI be able to capitalize on its first mover advantage? So I just asked the Cube AI what it thought, and it said it has potential to sustain its first mover advantage, blah, blah, blah. But it, however, AI is rapidly changing and evolving in order for OpenAI to capitalize on first mover advantage. must remain neutral. It's going to depend on the open source community, and then it gives me clips First clip, will open AI go the way of Friendster in MySpace? <laughs> what a great <laughs> clip that is. I got it right here. Nice. And the next one, what are the odds that chat GPT will sustain first mover advantage by the end of the decade? I just, I love this. We're using, I think, GPT-4 now. I think we're do, using two-shot prompts. It's getting better. What's the story with uh, I don't, the Cube I don't, AI? I, don't, I, don't, I think the Cube AI has nothing to do with open AI. That's the generative clips are using chat GPT for. This is using... This is using uh, yeah, yeah. our our no, transcripts I, I, and totally, but yeah, absolutely. But I was just talking about the content, not the 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 architecture, which was you know we we made that debate, and now you've got you got governments going after them, you got you know other competitors, you got open source, they're closed AI. Uh, I I wanted to bring this up only because I want to ask you like what's the status of the Cube AI? I think you're in private beta. You're kind of Letting yeah. people tr try it out. I mean, people are asking me, Dave, how can I get access to the well, Cube AI? Okay, so the Cube AI is open for wait list beta, and then I'm letting people in. We've got a wait list. But it's simple. You go to thecubeai.com, and you'll hit um, a site there, and you just hit um, enter the wait list. And then I get a dashboard screen that says, here's the list of the wait list. And I just say, invite, pops an email to you, check your spam folder or just check your email and then you sign in, you have access to the entire corpus. And what it is, is it's a, essentially it looks like a chat GPT interface, but it's from our 35,000 transcripts of interviews we've done over 13 years and all the clips that go with it and all the metadata, because we have text, audio and video, it's, it's what they call multimodal. So we now can have, you can type in text and get videos, put in videos to get text and other merchandising assets uh, we have a, a, a video cloud that does that so but chat gpt is uh, an in, inspiration for us to do cube ai on our language of which we then can go and interface and fuse data fusion into chat gpt if we want to help format so we've solved the problem of hallucinations um to the extent um of being completely wrong to like maybe a little bit wrong but like but good excellent so it's it's in alpha beta right now so it's getting better every day um training and inference is going on so it's all good it's gonna and then we hope it to be an interface for people to find what they're looking for so well in the future if someone could say hey what does dave Vellante think about open ai and then there it is what does andy jassy think about aws's new new uh ai plan uh, or what is the best thing that happened at the databricks summit but what i love about it john is you know you, people talk about explainability not only does it give you an answer, and yeah, sometimes it hallucinates, but it gives you an answer, brings in some some other, sort of mashes up some other opinions in the cube, but then it gives you clips and you can watch and actually listen to exactly what was said, who said it. I I, I love it. I mean- Where, where it's going to go, Dave, is going to be more compelling than that. It's going to be, you put text in, you get clips and data, you put video in, you get data and clips. So it works both ways. And then what's going to really get exciting, and this is something I think is going to be a big trend. We can we can pick it up on another pod or even talk about it at SuperCloud 3 next week. The personalization aspect is going to be off the charts. So our vision is to have an open corpus of data so that any user can personalize the content. For example, I got a, I do the treadmill for one hour and 15 minutes when I go to the gym for my cardio. I want to roll up a podcast audio only of what Dave Vellante thinks of breaking analysis this week, or what's the open AI. Uh, I want to learn about open AI. So give me an hour and 15 minutes of audio from experts. I got to commute. I want to train. I want some videos. I want to do a mashup. I want to edit videos. I want to include that video in my production, or I just want to lean back and learn or connect with people. Who's the best person to talk to that can talk about GPT three powered with Jasper AI, for instance. So or where where's LLMs going? You know the the other <laughs> the other thing I want I mean not to pimp all our shit but this is I, I I'm so excited about this so I did a breaking analysis last week, and it was a really hard one to to curate I used ChatGPT a little bit to actually quite a bit to curate I had three guests on and they were all they were all over the place so I I needed some help because I was really late for another thing I had to go to on the weekend I actually do 
you know, have weekends. You too, you know this, right? So, but so I I went to our video data lake and I, there was a button there that said auto clip. So I pushed it to see what would happen. I got 52 clips, all less than two minutes. Yeah. Of it was this was a long one. This was like an hour long, fifty two minute um, breaking analysis. All I, all I did was push the button, and the machine put in all the metadata, all the hashtags. I mean, amazing. I mean, the big three themes of Databricks conference: emphasis on owning analytics and moving up the stack, less focus on specific technologies, yeah. but, but like data warehousing. I mean, and it's all hashtagged, yeah, and it's 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 amazing. It's it's you know we get the linguistics the modeling down. It's it's been, you know, hoarding all that data for thirteen years kind of came in handy when this big language models. We were already doing entity extraction, which is you know trivial form of kind of uh, machine learning and, and data management. Uh, but when um, the the massive models came out and all the new technology, really put us in a great position. In fact, I'm looking at the query here that you just ran. Will open AI be able to capitalize the first mover advantage? And then here's a clip. Let's see if it plays in here. Can you hear this? No, can't hear it. Can you hear that? It's not coming across. It's a 30 second clip on inflation. So we just talked about that. So I think remixing content will be huge. And right now you're seeing that on these platforms. And this is why I think the Hollywood people are scared because of remixing um, AI generative content. I was talking with our guys in the studio uh, the other day the, in the office that, you know, why are we, why, why not just have, why not have mid journey graphics on our screens while we're talking? Let's do some um, meme overlays. Why can't we get AI to go to a database at runtime and inject better special effects on the fly? As we're talking, right? So, and and if you start getting user-generated interactions, say in a live feed, you can make make things pop on the screen differently. So, I think there's going to be a huge interactivity boom in uh, media, and it's going to come from these uh, evolutions of the AIs. First, get your your language models, your foundation models right. Um, and again, we're lucky we're sitting on a treasure trove here, Dave. So I'm pumped too. I got to say, we'll see where it goes. But if you're out there, on the cubeai.com, check it out um play with it if you want to get on the wait list just you know sign up i'll let you in if you listen to this podcast um drop us a note and we'll, we'll hook you up so cool next week super cloud dave yeah i'm stoked john the lineup is amazing um we got a bunch of ceos and CISOs coming into the studio we got a bunch of technologists we're dropping in all the pre-records that we did with guys like uh, matthew prince of of Cloudflare and George Kurtz of, of CrowdStrike and so many others. I mean, uh, uh, CISOs and practitioners, and it's just, I learned a lot. I, I, it's all in my head and I can't wait to actually do the live program, John, and then summarize and synthesize two days of content. Supercloud.world yeah. is the website. Go Definitely go sign up. You don't have to register to listen, but we appreciate it if you do, because then you yeah. can go in and do some other things on the platform. But it's going to be good. All really right. Exciting. Dave, great to check in with you. If weekly pod 20, we hit our milestone. We're going to make, now take a look back and look at uh, our reps, um, look at what we want to double down on. If you listen to this podcast, have feedback for us, send us a note. I'm on uh, all DMs are open, all channels open. And of course, go to siliconangle.com. That's where all the uh, content's posted. That's where all the traffic is. The cube.net's a great catalog for community. We're going to make that site. Uh, much better. You start to see more community that site. Of course, the cubeai.com is the um, is the is the beta product that's going to be um, innovating pretty quickly. And we'll see you next time uh, for Pod Twenty One. Have a great weekend. See you next week, John.